Hi, everybody. I'd love to introduce V. Hughes from the University of Cincinnati. Uh, she's been working on a lot of high energy physics uh, projects, which, you know, like using machine learning and uh, we'll give us insights about that. Thank you very much. Welcome, V. Hi, thank you. So I am going to give a very incomplete overview of the use of machine learning and high energy physics. Uh, this is an extremely broad topic. There are so many more applications than I could ever hope to cover. Um, and so this is going to be kind of like a, a quick introduction, firstly, to some concepts to talk in a very general sense about, um, I mean, firstly, the kinds of things we're trying to do in high energy physics and also how we utilize machine learning to do those and how we simulate and reconstruct in kind of a broad way. Um, and so I'm going to start with an overview of some of the phenomenology, specifically of neutrino physics. I would love to cover phenomenology of other types of physics I'll be touching on as well, but that will be a whole talk. So I'll, I'll give a, a quick kind of reduced overview of those. Um, then I'll talk through the, the typical simulation and reconstruction workflows we use in high energy physics. I'll take specific reference to one experiment that I work on, uh, but also I'll try to call attention to the kind of gen generalities and commonalities there that kind of extrapolate out to all different types of particle physics. Um, and then I'll give a quick uh, incomplete history of machine learn learning usage in high energy physics from my perspective. So the kind of um, early adoption uh, around a decade ago of convolutional neural network workflows um, and how that has kind of spun out into developing graph neural network architectures that are kind of specifically optimized towards particle physics. Um, and I'll, I'll kind of end by going from where we are now to project forward to the future, looking at the, the different things some people are doing in the field and thinking about how to tie those together into kind of next generation architectures. So as I said, let me start with uh, a little bit of physics, a little bit of phenomenology. I personally am a neutrino physicist, um, and so I study specifically uh, a type of phenomenon called neutrino oscillations. Um, so three of the 17 fundamental particles that we know about in the standard models are neutrinos. They are light uh, leptons, neutral leptons. Um, and we know that there are exactly three light active neutrinos. So the, the electron, muon, and tau neutrinos. Uh, each of those has a charged lepton counterpart. Um, we know that there are exactly three because of an experiment called the Large Electron Positron Collider, um, which measured uh, the width of the Z boson, which is the kind of neutral gauge boson for the weak force. Um, this is a really beautiful result because you can see how perfectly the experimental results here for the, for the cross section of the Z agree with the theoretical prediction for exactly three neutrino generations, right? So you can just about see at the peak of that distribution um, the data point including error bars. So the error bars are incredibly precise here, and that's how we know there are exactly three neutrinos. However, in the 90s, um, our understanding of neutrinos kind of exploded in some ways. So up until that point, we thought we understood neutrinos very well, that there were three of them that were completely independent particles. And as far as we knew, they were massless. They didn't have any mass. Uh, this got complicated by uh, something called the solar neutrino problem. So there was an experiment called Homestake, which is in a, was in a gold mine, a former gold mine in South Dakota. Um, that was studying the flux of electron neutrinos produced in the sun. So the sun produces light, it also produces neutrinos at a similar rate. And we have a lot of theoretical models that describe the processes that occur in the sun. And from that, we can derive an expectation of how many neutrinos we we're expecting to see. So the Homestake experiment uh, set out to measure the electron neutrino flux from the sun. And what they found was that data had a significant deficit with respect to what the theoretical prediction was. Um, and so this was what was called the solar neutrino problem, right? Why is there this inconsistency between our expectation and the data? Um, this inconsistency was eventually resolved by the Sudbury Neutrino Observatory and also Super Cameo Candy, um, two experiments that uh, solved this problem with what's called neutrino flavor mixing. Right. So these experiments measure not just the electron neutrino flux, but also the neutral current flux of neutrinos, which is kind of a, a flavor insensitive measure of the overall neutrino rate. 
what they found was even though there was a deficit in the electron neutrino flux, the overall neutral current flux was consistent with our predictions. And so what actually was occurring here is what's called an adiabatic flavor conversion, when electrons, sorry, neutrinos are being produced in an electron flavor state in the sun. But by the time they arrive here on Earth, they've actually evolved into a combination of all three flavor types. So this had pretty profound uh, implications. So we know that the neutrino flavors uh, are no longer independent of each other, right? A neutrino can be produced in one flavor and interact in a different flavor, right? And so this, this uh, kind of launched this field of neutrino oscillations, which characterizes that change, um, as well as a lot of other fields of neutrino studies. So for instance, the fact that neutrinos change means they cannot be massless because they experience the passage of time. And so there are other experiments that I won't have time to talk about today that try to measure the mass of the neutrino directly. Very quickly, uh, some phenomenology of how neutrinos oscillate. Neutrinos uh, are typically uh, characterized using six parameters in terms of the oscillation. So we have these three neutrino mass states that complement the neutrino flavor states. Um, and from the oscillations, we can actually measure the distance between those mass states. So these two mass differences, delta m squared 2, 1, and delta m squared 3, 1. There are also three mixing angles, which describe the mixing between the different mass states and a CP violating phase delta. Um, most of this, uh, the details of this are not super relevant for this talk, uh, but I will say at a high level, um, essentially the way that neutrino mixing occurs is you have three neutrino flavor states and three neutrino mass states, and you have this three by three rotation matrix, the PMNS matrix, that kind of translates between the two. Neutrino will be produced in a definite flavor state. It will then propagate in a combination of mass states, which evolve as it, as it travels. And then by the time it interacts, it is now in a different superposition of the mass states, which corresponds to a different mixture of flavor states. You can characterize this three by three matrix uh, as a product of three simpler two by two rotation matrices. Um, and then we can kind of take a look at the, the general formalism of neutrino oscillations uh, using uh, a simpler two flavor approximation, right? This is the oscillation probability here between the flavor states alpha and beta. Um, you can see you have two sine squared terms here. Um, the first is uh, proportional to or, or uh, the sine squared of two times the angle, the mixing angle. And so this is an overall kind of scaling of the amplitude of the oscillations. Um, whereas the second term here depends on the mass splitting, but also on the path length and the energy of the neutrino, right? So this means that uh, neutrino oscillations kind of scale as a function of what we call L over E, the baseline divided by the energy. And so it depends, the, the oscillation probability of a neutrino depends on how much energy it has and also how far it's traveled. Um, and that also means that the delta M squared parameter here is what's determining the frequency of the oscillations, right? So you have the amplitude is set by the angle and the frequency is set by the mass. Bit. And that's kind of a, a general uh, description of how a neutrino oscillates. Wait, I have to stop because it just sounds odd. Path length, the age? Yes, the distance traveled by the neutrino. So is that an approximation or is that a more fundamental phenomenon? Of that's, a, that's a fundamental phenomenon. Oh, so like neutrinos, neutrino oscillation um, fundamentally is a, uh, the, the frequency of the oscillation scales inversely with the energy. Um, mm -hmm. And so you get this L over E oscillation. It, it leads to some pretty interesting and complicated oscillation patterns. I wish I had uh, right. some, put some oscillation plots in this talk, actually. Um, but it, it, even in the two flavor approximation, you, you get, because typically we work in terms of the observables as a function of energy, right? Mm -hmm. And so you get this oscillation maximum that occurs at one specific point in energy um, where the oscillations kind of turn on. And then when you get higher and higher in energy after that, the oscillations occur more and more rapidly in energy until typically they get so rapid that we can't resolve them. They, they go under our energy resolution. And so they kind of average out to um, kind of a, a flat deficit. Um, but this, this can get very complicated once you kind of take the product of the three, um, two by two. If you take, if you imagine three of these um, kind of two by two approximations, uh, and then convolve them together. That's kind of the full picture. Um, 
we have we have different kind of distance scales for each of the each of the the mass yeah, stations. Yeah. We would call uh, delta m squared three two, which is what we typically study um, for long baseline neutrino experiments, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. Is referred to as kind of the atmospheric um, mass splitting and the atmospheric parameters, because at the distance scale where this two by two part of the overall uh, framework is dominant is kind of in the distance scales of neutrinos produced in the atmosphere of the Earth, measuring them. Um, okay. Uh, uh, cool, thank you. Sure, of course. Um, so yes, let me let me kind of contextualize this within kind of the experimental framework. Um, we understand to uh, relatively good precision most of the oscillation parameters at this point, but there are still a few major unknowns. So, for instance, the, the big two are we know the um, absolute value of the delta m squared 3, 1, and 3, 2 very well. But the ch channels we have studied up until this point with high precision are only sensitive to the value and not to the sign. So we actually don't know whether that third mass state lives above or below the other two. Um, we also have uh, no idea right now or, or only very weak limits on the value of the delta CP parameter, which is important because that can kind of dictate um, and help contribute to the reason why we have a asymmetry of matter and antimatter in the universe and why we live in a matter-dominated universe. Um, and so uh, long baseline neutrino experiments like DUNE, the deep underground neutrino experiment, are designed to, uh, to try and resolve those questions. Uh, the way they do that is by producing a beam of neutrinos. Uh, so for Dune, that's going to be around in the 1 to 10 giga electron volt range in terms of their energies, which is, again, where the oscillations should be largest for a baseline of 1,300 kilometers, which is what Dune uses. So here at Fermilab in Chicago, we have the, the main injector, which is a, a proton accelerator. So we accelerate protons and then shoot them down into a beam line that produces neutrinos. And then we aim that down into the Earth at an angle. And because of the curvature of the Earth, those neutrinos will propagate through the Earth. Neutrinos are, are very um, elusive. They, they interact very rarely, which is why we understand so little about them. Um, and so they can just propagate directly through the Earth. They come out um, in South Dakota, uh, or they will when this beam is, is running, um, at the Sanford Underground Research Facility, which actually is the, the same uh, location as Homestake, where the the uh, previous experiment I mentioned was also based. This is around a mile underground. So Dune is going to be um, a very large liquid argon time projection chamber detector underground in a gold mine in a very low background environment. Um, and the the primary physics goal of the experiment is to study these these neutrinos, the beam of neutrinos, directly after they've been produced and also after they've propagated for around 800 miles to study them on both ends and compare them to try and characterize how they've changed. Um, so that's the, the, the kind of primary physics that I do is oscillation physics. Um, I've also worked on some rare processes. So these uh, deep underground neutrino experiments, generally any detector that is in a low background environment and is very large and stable is good for neutrino oscillations, but also good for doing a whole host of other physics. So things like rare processes like uh, people are working on proton decay, for instance, as a spontaneous beyond standard model process, um, and other things like that. Like these, these, uh, these types of experiments can be leveraged to do a lot of different things. Although things like searching for supernova burst neutrinos. Um, a little bit more on the detector technology because that's going to be uh, most relevant, I think, for um, for this talk on the machine learning side. Um, as I said, we use liquid argon time projection chambers, or LAR-TPCs for short. Um, this is the, the kind of benchmark technology that will be used by Dune. There will be 70,000 tons worth of liquid argon in this underground cavern, uh, as well as near-detector geometries. But uh, other experiments at Fermilab have and are leveraging this technology. So there is a, an experiment that has actually been decommissioned now, Microboon, that I worked on way back in the, in the early days of grad school, um, and then other detectors like Icarus and the short baseline near detector um, that use this technology. And effectively, the, the, the very short summary of how it works is it is a, think of it like a, a giant cryostat filled with cryogenically cooled liquid argon. 
Now, argon is an inert, which means that as a charged particle propagates through the argon, it's going to ionize the argon as it travels and leave kind of a, a ghostly after image of electrons behind. Um, that is, is essentially a representation of the particle tracks through the detector. Um, we then induce a very large electric, electric field across the argon, which causes those electrons to drift towards a series of wires, um, uh, different wire planes at different pitches where they induce a charge on the wires and finally are collected. Um, and because the wires are at different pitches, this essentially gives us three different 2D representations of the 3D interaction, which we can then reconstruct back into the 3D, full 3D interaction. That process is, is something I'll spend a lot of time talking about in, in this talk. Um, but for detectors like Dune, the wire spacing is around three millimeters, which means we end up with this really beautiful, very high resolution image of the particle um, interactions in the detector. And so there's a huge wealth of information that these detectors give us. Um, and so a lot of the, the work that I will discuss today is thinking about how we can develop algorithms to make full use of the information that the detectors give us. Uh, a brief slide on the Large Hadron Collider. I will also be talking about some applications for, for the LHC. Um, so this is a little different. It's studying different types of particle physics to Dune. This is what's called the energy frontier as opposed to the neutrino physics being the intensity frontier, right? The intensity frontier is all about making a, and measuring as many neutrinos as possible because they interact so rarely. But neutrinos are everywhere, they're abundant. Um, whereas the types of particles studied at the Large Hadron Collider, especially the High Luminosity Large Hadron Collider, are particles at very, very high energy, right? Particles that simply aren't going to be produced in lab conditions, right? You need a very powerful collider in order to, uh, in order to even produce them in the first place. Um, and so following this upgrade, the High Lumi LHC will uh, be able to collide protons uh, at up to 14 TeV of energy, which is which is a very high energies, um, more so than, than anybody else has been able to do. Um, and so at this point, I think the, the primary physics goals of the high lumi LHC are improving our standard model measurements. So the things we already know, we can measure to higher precision with more energy. Um, this also allows us to search for any new rare processes that we that may be hiding up at those energy scales that we've never seen. And then also things like flavor physics, so studying the, the heavier quarks and so on. And the thing I'll highlight here also is the detected geometry. So this is a CMS geometry. You, you basically have these radial layers of, of silicon um, that, that will uh, produce detector uh, hits, um, kind of energy depositions when a charged particle travels through them. And so you have these kind of radial layers um, propagating out from the central beam pipe. Um, that are, that are getting hit as the, the particle jets and tracks propagate through them. A quick note on how we do physics. Um, kind of motivating a lot of the, the things I'll be talking about in terms of simulation. Uh, particle physics data is typically way too complicated to analyze directly, right? You can't take what comes out of the detector and convert that directly into some fundamental physics parameter, right? Like the oscillation parameters that I mentioned earlier. Um, instead, the way you do physics is you define a test statistic, right, um, that can compare the data uh, to the underlying physics parameters of interest, right, and, and figure out how compatible the data you've extracted is with the physics. Um, for neutrino physics, we're operating in the low statistics regime, again, because neutrinos uh, are, can be kind of hard to detect. Everyone is precious. And so we use a Poisson log likelihood as, as a typical test statistic. Um, and in the uh, Poisson log likelihood, right? You're comparing the observed data x, right, to this predicted um, measurement m, right, where m is your kind of prediction, and this is where the simulation comes comes in, right? You need to be able to predict this this kind of simulated analog to the real data, right? And so in this plot in the top right, this is from a recent Nova uh, neutrino oscillation paper, actually to um, to relate this back to the phenomenology I was discussing before, you can see there's this kind of dip that occurs uh, around uh, one to two GeV in this plot. Um, I'm not sure if you can, I don't think I can use my mouse here, but uh, but you can see that the, at the start of these distributions, it kind of turns on, then it dips down again, and then it jumps back up. Um, in fact, that dip is the 
disappearance of neutrinos due to oscillations, right? And so the, the, the point at which that dip is at its deepest in energy is actually telling us indirectly the value of delta m squared, right? Um, and so in order to do physics, we need to have some kind of mechanism that for a given set of the oscillation parameters or whatever physics parameters you care about, it can predict what your spectrum should look like at that point in parameter space. And then you can use a test statistic to figure out how compatible that is with your data. Right? And so the, the kind of big important point here is that this approach requires a really high degree of precision in your simulation, right? You need to be able to produce a simulated spectrum that is as good uh, um, an analog as possible for the real data. Your ability to produce robust physics results relies on that, right? The, the way that you get to kind of contours, like one on the bottom right, um, telling us which, uh, which values of the oscillation parameters are allowed at which confidence intervals, that all depends on having gone through this very complicated simulation chain. Okay, so that's why we simulate. So question about the simulation. So I get the, <clears throat> you have to account for all the physics, the, you know, the, the various parameters that you might exist. You have to have the details of the experiment itself, but also you need to have the distribution of the particles as they fly through the beam, like all the initial conditions. Yes. To, like that one is a bit of a mystery to me because how, what assumptions can you have about those things and how valid are they? That's a great question. Um, the answer is there is uh, a lot of work that goes into um, predicting the initial conditions. I actually will, um, was about to go through, step through some of the simulation chain, but actually I think that you have highlighted the fact that the place where my stepping through the simulation chain um, begins is actually already past some of the things you were referencing. The answer is that you have to have a very detailed um, simulation chain with a lot of steps in order to uh, actually get to a robust um, prediction of the, the output yeah. spectrum, right? And so the so the, the next step that I was going to talk about, this is my next yeah. slide, is talking about event generation, so generating neutrino interactions and then stepping that through. But actually, even by this point, you have had to run upstream simulation to be able to do this. Um, you get the particles in there. Right, so yeah. so we start from this is this is starting from the neutrino interacting, but as you pointed out, there is a an, a, a whole chain of the um, spinning up the protons in the main injector, you know, figuring out what their energy distribution and momentum distribution is, and then we have a detailed beamline simulation typically that is completely independent of the chain I'm about to talk about, where you uh, need to basically simulate. The, there's a whole chain where you, the way the beam line operates is you start with the protons. Those are incident on a target, which is typically something like graphite. That produces um, charged particles like pions and kaons, which will decay in flight into neutrinos. But the problem with neutrinos, because they are so elusive, right, is once you have a neutrino, it's impossible to focus or direct. And so what we end up needing to do is we have these magnetic focusing horns where we, after the protons have collided with the target and produced pions and kaons, we then focus the charged particles as tightly as we can using these, this focusing apparatus, this kind of optical system um, that is using magnetic fields. Um, and then once they have been focused, they then go into a decay pipe where they will decay and flight into the neutrinos. Right, and so there's a lot of work that goes into um, simulating the neutrino flux, right? And typically, you have like a um, a the 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 beamline simulation that determines the neutrino flux is independent of the the, the downstream kind of experiment simulation chain that I'm I'll talk about here. By the time we do right. this event generation, we are using kind of encoded flux files that are the output of the, the primary beamline simulation. Got it. That makes sense. We have like these distributions at this point. Right. Exactly. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Uh, and so um, once we have arrived at the neutrinos, um, simulating the, the initial interaction typically involves some kind of specialized simulation, right? This is what we refer to as an event generator in physics, right? Um, and uh, for neutrino physics, specifically for most US-based neutrino oscillation experiments, we use a package called Genie, which is a neutrino event generator specifically. And so there's a lot of um, 
complicated like cross-section models, um, a lot of uh, physics that goes into the genie package that, that kind of can implement a lot of the different um, algorithms that people can use and different descriptions people can use for different you know kind of sub processes things like uh, is it an elastic or quasi elastic interaction is it resonant is it coherent is it what's called deep and elastic scattering all of these look very different and so we we have a kind of dedicated neutrino event generators that handle that um, I'll note that, that depending on the type of physics you're doing this varies pretty wildly there is no standard solution for the event generation so for instance if you are working at the LHC and you're looking at proton collisions, you might simulate, for instance, a, a, a top uh, pair production, a top quark pair production interaction using something like Pythia. Um, depending on the type of physics you care about, usually the generator will be very different. Um, I studied a, a rare process for my PhD, and actually for, for, for that process, there was no event generator, so I had to write my own. Um, and so this this truly is, there's no one-size-fits-all solution here. It, it really depends on what you're trying to do specifically. Um, but in neutrino physics, we're trying to simulate the initial interaction of the neutrino inside an atomic nucleus um, and generate the outgoing particles, which we call primaries, right? So the input here is um, the, the kind of fluxes that I that we mentioned previously, like um, the, the models that are in, encapsulated inside Genie. Um, and the output of this first step, the event generation, is the primaries, right? So if you imagine your muon neutrino is propagating along, it is one of the few lucky ones that will actually interact. Um, so let's say it interacts in the atomic nucleus with a, a neutron in this case. Um, it scatters from the neutron um, and interacts via a W boson, uh, which means there will be charge exchanged. Um, and so the, the byproducts of this interaction, this is a very clean topology, what's called a, a quasi-elastic interaction. Um, the byproducts are a proton and a muon, right? And so each of these will have some amount of momentum. They will also have directionality. Um, the, the specifics of, even for a simple topology like this, the, the specifics of the directionality and momentum and things like that, there is a lot of kind of kinematics that goes into those. Um, so even a simple topology is kind of complicated in terms of the physics that determines um, what these outgoing particles are and what directionality they have. Right? And so what comes out of this step is essentially uh, four vectors right? With, with specific particle types right? to say, here's a proton. It is pointed in this direction, and it has this much energy, and so on. Once we have uh, generated the primaries, we now need to turn that into something we can actually see, um, right? We These particles at this point are still situated right outside the, the atom where they were produced, right? And so we need to know what they're actually going to do in our detector environment. Um, and this is a step that is more uh, kind of common and generic across different particle physics experiments. Um, for this, where you're dealing in the regime of like the standard visible particles that we tend to um, typically understand pretty well. We just need to use a kind of a powerhouse simulation to figure out what is going to happen to these primaries in the detector environment, right? And so we use JAMP4, as, as a lot of people do, uh, both inside and outside particle physics, right? It has a lot of, JAMP4 gets a lot of use in um, industry, right? Medical imaging, all kinds of things. It's a pretty standard solution. Um, and so what that's going to do is it's going to take our primaries and step them um, through a detailed simulation of the detector geometry, both the detector itself and its surrounding environment, um, and figure out what the trajectories of these particles will be and also what their ultimate fates are, right? So for instance, this proton, protons tend to be highly ionizing, um, which means they deposit more energy per unit distance, which means they range out much faster. So this proton, perhaps Jan will pick it up and step it a handful of steps, and, and then the proton will just range out. The muon is minimum ionizing, so you know, right, step it further, right? This muon actually makes it further through the detector. And for each one of these steps, it's basically throwing random numbers to determine what is going to happen to this muon, right? Um, and then let's say at, at the end of its track, Jan decides that this muon is going to end in what's called a Michel electron, which is a, a short electron track. Um, and so we, we will simulate all of the children as well. And if they have children, then we'll simulate those and so on. Um, and for large events, this can get pretty complicated. Um, a question or observation. It sounds like you're talking about distribution of events in Monte Carlo, not wave function. Right, that's right, right. yes. So yeah, is that just approximation? Like, are you just trying to approximate the wave function with a lot of samples? Or is there other 
are there other errors in that uh, visualizing other than number samples? No, there's no. So we don't tend to think of this type of simulation in terms of the wave function directly. Mm -hmm. This is this is just kind of like a standard stepping function, right? Yes. So so we don't we we do consider discrete steps, right? Mm -hmm. This is how Jan4 handles that. This type of um, this type of simulation is not kind of continuous in that way, unfortunately. Right. It would be great if it was, but uh, but typically the workflows we use in particle physics um, are, are kind of more discretized like this. So, I guess why? I mean, when I, <clears throat> when you talk about like quantum chemistry, you I mean you go from proper quantum, the quantum chemistry, then molecular dynamics and whatnot, and they, at, there's a certain point where they drop the quantum. Um, and I guess what allows you to do that? Like, is it that the particles don't interact that much with each other, uh, or some other reasons? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think part of it is historical, right? Mm -hmm. That Jan four has developed in this way, and it, it does, you know, for the um, types of processes we use it for, and for this type of simulation, it actually does do a pretty decent job, right? Mm -hmm. um, we don't have to think of things in terms of wave functions all that much. I know people; there are people who are working kind of more thinking about differentiable simulation, um, and. Uh, yeah, there, there, there was some. So I was at the the CHAP conference, computing and high energy physics last summer, and it is something that people are thinking about. But I suspect it is probably uh, a while away from being used as standard in high energy physics. Um, Gen four is um, pretty widely used, um, and and uh, this kind of stepwise simulation tends to suit most people's needs in terms of once you get to this type of particle tracking pretty well. Actually, one thing you brought up for ML, these are not differentiable, pretty much by design. Right. So now the if we left samples with Monte Carlo, can you neurally surrogate? Can you get a neural surrogate of the many sample regime? Right. So so yes, this will. Um, I think this is for the for the types of machine learning I will be discussing. This is not necessarily directly. Um, this part of the simulation doesn't need to be differentiable in order okay. to do do the kind of machine learning in order to perform the kind of machine learning tasks we want to, at least not the first order, right? right. Um, typically, in order to do physics at all, we have to have very high statistics simulation. Um, and so the fact that we have access to this high statistics simulation to begin with means that a lot of these questions about differentiability kind of fall out to first order. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that makes sense. Thank you. Sure. And so again, the, the typical workflow here, um, not just with the trajectories, um, like as you step uh, in these discrete steps, you're also keeping track of the, the energy deposited with each step, right? Um, and so once you have these energy deposits in your detector, the final step is detector simulation, right? We need to simulate what the response of the detector to those true energy depositions is going to be. Um, to turn what is really happening in our detector to what we actually read out, right? This is typically custom for every individual experiment. Every detector is different, right? This is this is more or less true. So, for instance, I mentioned Fermilab has a number of liquid argon experiments, and all of those do share some kind of common framework for doing this, the detector simulation. So you're not reinventing from scratch, but every detector is different, right? And so it is pretty standard for every detector to kind of handle their own detector simulation to some degree or another. And so for liquid argon TPC, the kind of things you need to worry about are you have these true ionization energy deposits in your detector. Um, and the way the detector operates, right, you have this uh, la large electric field under which the electrons are going to drift towards the wire plane. But as they drift, they're gonna, some of them are gonna um, recombine with the argon, right? So you get some energy loss that is dependent on the distance traveled. Um, you also have some pretty complicated space charge effects that occur in the detector. Um, and so um, there's a lot of simulating the uh, electric field, for instance, in the recombination that you need to take, take into account. And then once the energy depositions actually arrive at the wires, um, you then need to simulate the readout, right? How those, um, energy deposits induce a charge on the wires and are finally collected by the last wire plane, and then also the response of your electronics, things like that. So there's a lot to think about. And what you're finally left with once you read those out um, is 
raw waveforms on these wires, which is the simulated analog for the real data, right? And so the simulation chain is stepping through a bunch of different conceptual layers here, right? You're starting with the neutrino, you're going to the interaction byproducts, you're then simulating their children, you're thinking about the energy deposited by those particles, and then you're thinking about how those true energy depositions translate into what you actually observe, right? And when you're working with the simulation, you have access to all of that information, right? So asking the question of like, when you look at an event saying, what was this is trivial because you have the Monte Carlo truth, right? But when you're working with the data, you only see the observables, right? You only have access to what comes out of the detector, those raw waveforms. And so in order to do physics with the data, we now need to step through this hierarchy in reverse to try and reverse engineer what do we see and how do we turn that into um, you know what particles were contained in the event, and um, and you know what was the initial interaction that kind of was the genesis of all of this, right? And this is reconstruction. So in in particle physics, the traditional reconstruction chain. This is an example. Not all of them work like this, but um, you take your detector hits. These are kind of discrete energy depositions. Um, sometimes a detector will produce hits naturally. Um, other times, like with a liquid ion TVC, there are a couple of processing steps you need to get to the hits. So if you have raw waveforms, you need to apply some kind of signal deconvolution to turn them into a kind of a, a neater form. And then once they've been uh, processed and deconvolved, you can then use the Gaussian hit finding to basically um, uh, discretize the energy depositions into discrete um, objects, which we call hits, right? And so. This is an example of like a 2D representation of hits in a TPC, right? Um, these are uh, the plotted in, um, so this is wire, TPC wire coordinate along the x-axis and the arrival time of the hit on the wire on the y-axis. And this is this is essentially showing what I talked about before, that, that these wire planes are giving you these really nice uh, high resolution representations of the particle tracks in the detector, right? And so you can basically see this is this is an example of a very simple muon track with a Michel electron at the end, um, and this is kind of the the output that you get out of the detector. The color coding here is based on truth information. So when you're reconstructing the data, you don't even have the the color coding here, right? You just have a series of discrete energy depositions, right? And the way that a traditional reconstruction algorithm might work is first you would have some algorithm to group together the hits into clusters, right? Um, have something like, a, for instance, a, a Kalman filter algorithm or something like that, just trying to draw a line um, and group together these hits into uh, clusters, into objects, right? Because you have multiple 2D uh, representations, you might, having done that on, on the different 2D representations, want to merge those between 2D views to form these 3D prongs, right? To try and match together the 2D prongs, the 2D clusters into prongs. Um, and then once you've formed kind of clusters, um, you might then want to do something like particle identification, right? Once you, once you have a particle track, you can ask questions like, what type of particle produced this, right? You can use knowledge of physics, things like the beta equation um, for energy deposition to try and disambiguate different types of particle in terms of how they produce tracks. Um, and then once you have an idea of how many particles there are in your event and also what type of particles they were, you can then use that to come up with a hypothesis on what the initial interaction was, right? Um, and so there are a lot of steps here. Um, I'll note that uh, a lot of the steps in traditional reconstruction are purely geometric, right? Which is to say that not all of them are really physically motivated, right? Um, once you have formed a track, you may use our knowledge of physics to try to uh, determine which type of particle produced it. But the, the actual grouping based on forming a track isn't really all that physics motivated, right? It's, it's just an algorithm, right? Um, Another thing you tend to see in these kind of traditional reconstruction chains that are very modular is you have a lot of steps, right? You're going through a lot of smaller steps. Each of those introduces more inefficiency, right? And so even if you have a relatively high efficiency on each individual step, if you're applying a lot of them, then over time you kind of winnow away your data that you fought hard to, to collect. You're kind of losing a lot of it because it's it's more and more of it is dropping off with each of these steps. And you end up with this kind of death by a thousand cuts, um, where by the time you've applied all of your reconstruction algorithms, maybe you only have, have reconstructed some fraction of the, the data you started with, right? Um, and so modular reconstruction like this 
typically optimizes each individual step, but it isn't thinking about in, in optimizing the full chain kind of as a holistic whole, right? So if you think about the example I mentioned previously, PD clustering and matching, right? This is the, the full three-plane event display that I showed previously. Um, and in that third plane, you can see the Michel electron is very strongly overlapping with um, the muon track. So if my clustering algorithm is looking at each one of these representations independently, um, there's a good chance that in this view, it isn't going to pick up on the fact that there is a second track in this event, right? Um, and so if you fail at this point to um, make that connection, then when you go to merge those 2D clusters downstream, you aren't going to do it successfully because you don't have a candidate in that third view, right? Um, and this is a case where, you know, as a human, I can say, well, I can see that there, there is a, a second track in these other two views, and so I can infer that there is a track in, in that third view. Um, and I can use that information, that context information, right, to, to say, well, let's let's draw that second track in there, right? But, but a lot of reconstruction chains actually don't have the capacity to do that, right? By the time you get to the point of merging, it is no longer accessible to you to go back, right? Um, and so you could think about whether a kind of full end-to-end -end, um, machine learning-based reconstruction uh, might be able to make up some of these effects, right? The, the fact that we have a detailed simulation gives us um, a lot of opportunities to do supervised machine learning, right? Where we, we can have this wealth of truth information on all of our events that we can use to produce truth labels, to then train a neural network to do some of these things, right? Um, uh, a quick note, I, I realize I'm actually taking a lot of time here, so I'm gonna try and speed up a little bit. Um, one of the reasons we can do the machine learn learning work that we do is because of open data sets. So a lot of the work I'll talk about today concerns two specific open data sets. Um, this kind of gets around the fact that the particle physics data is typically proprietary, right? It is the experiment that produces it has ownership of it and um, justifiably, right, um, collaboration approval is usually required to kind of publish work based on um, the experiment data. Um, and so the, the benefit of open data releases, right, is that you can release an open data set that allows people to develop machine learning applications um, in a, in a and, and feel free to publish based on those in a um, very nice kind of open collaborative way. Um, so the LHC has this track ML data set, which is kind of a, a subset of um, um, top quark pair production events in the LHC detector. Um, with a bunch of kind of background collisions overlaid on top, right? The idea being here is like a full LHC data set um, that people can use to try and uh, try and develop machine learning applications to reconstruct that, right? And they actually had a, a challenge, right, to to encourage people to try to develop algorithms to reconstruct this data set as as a uh, uh, efficiently and as effectively as possible. Um, and actually, very recently, one of my collaborators um, just uh, worked with the Microboon collaboration to produce a liquid argon TPC open data release, which I've linked here. Um, this is simulation of neutrino interactions from the booster beam, which is the neutrino beam that they study at Fermilab. And again, this has some kind of background overlaid on top. This is cosmic data is overlaid on top of the neutrino interaction. So you can see in this bottom right image that the actual neutrino here is in red. Um, and then the rest of the activity in blue there is kind of unrelated cosmic noise um, that the, um, you know, part, part of the, the challenge of reconstructing these events is trying to figure out what is signal and, and what is just cosmic background noise. Um, so there are a lot of common um, machine learning tasks in high energy physics, um, a lot of use cases, for particle reconstruction, and actually um, machine learning enables uh, a few workflows that are not possible with traditional reconstruction, right? One of the major ones is event classification, right? So if you if you have some input interaction um, that you can classify and truth label according to, for instance, neutrino flavor um, holistically for the event, you can train a neural network on the um, interaction as a whole to try and reconstruct what the um, the, the kind of initiating particle the neutrino was, right? And this allows you to make a really big leap, right? Right from the final stage in the hierarchy, the observables, all the way back to the initial particle, right? Which uh, making that kind of leap is not quite so easy to do with a traditional algorithm. Um, also have, think about particle reconstruction, right? Things like clustering, grouping together objects, um, 
identifying particles, right? Once you have clusters, trying to um, determine what particle type um, produced that cluster. And then things like estimating parameters, specifically thinking about things like track parameters, right? So for a given particle, regressing things like the um, momentum of the particle, uh, the directionality, things like the neutrino vertex, right? The point in space where the neutrino interacted is not always something you see in the event, but it's very important to know in order to effectively do neutrino physics, right? So this is kind of a, a quick history of the use of, the early use of CNNs um, in neutrino physics. Neutrino physics experiments were a pretty early adopter of CNNs. Um, because a lot of the detector technologies um, are these kind of multiple 2D representations of a 3D event, some of those detectors lend themselves pretty naturally to uh, populating a pixel map with the, the output of the detector and then using that kind of directly for some kind of output, right? So I think one of the first use cases is the NOVA experiment, right? NOVA utilizes a convolutional neural network. Um, and this is um, actually, the primary method NOVA uses to identify different types of neutrinos, right? So we, for a given neutrino candidate, we care about asking questions like, was this a muon-flavored neutrino, right, that produced one of these long muon tracks in the final state? Was it an electron neutrino that produced um, um, an electromagnetic shower in the final state? Or is it something like a neutral current interaction where you don't have a visible lepton in the final state, right? That, that NOVA has, with, with pretty good success, utilized this uh, CNN-based um, network for basically representing the two views that the neutrino detector gives you um, as a pixel map and then using that to predict the neutrino flavor. Um, this is a uh, mobile net architecture that, that NOVA uses for this at this point. Um, the DUNE experiment that I already mentioned, it actually uses a, a successor to the NOVA um, convolutional neural network. The, the lineage is, is you know, the, the, the Dune implementation has its roots in the NOVA implementation. Um, and actually, currently, if you look at things like the um, Dune uh, design reports, right, when they report the physics sensitivity for how how we expect to, how, how precisely we expect to be able to measure oscillation parameters, the, the, this convolutional neural network for neutrino identifier, neutrino identification is actually the um, the benchmark method that they use, right, is is the the most performant method that is currently being used, uh, and so it's kind of the the standard um, that is used for sensitivities in Dune right now. Going beyond this, um, Nova has also kind of expanded on the event classification to try and um, do particle level identification, um, right? So the idea is you have a convolutional neural network that looks at the full event and a specific prong in the event at the same time, and kind of learns the correlations there to try and, for a specific prong, predict the particle type, right? To, to look at a, a given track and, for instance, say this is a muon or this is a proton, um, and so on. And then also protodune, which is the um, prototype detector at CERN for Dune, um, kind of the test module, um, they've utilized a convolutional neural network for track shower separation, right? So electromagnetic showers that are produced by um, electrons and by photons tend to give these electromagnetic cascades, right? And so you get this kind of cone structure, which in a lower resolution detector is actually pretty easy to reconstruct because it really does look like a cone. Um, when you have a very high resolution detector like this and you can really resolve that substructure, um, that actually makes the problem of uh, separating out tracks from showers a little bit more challenging because you can resolve the kind of internal track structure of the shower. Um, and so Protodune has had success basically developing a CNN that's trained on like these, these images that are specific regions of interest around particles um, to help to separate out um, electromagnetic showers from more track-like depositions. Um, and so that's CNNs. CNNs are still being used a lot of places in neutrino physics, um, but they do have their limitations, right? Um, it was a pretty natural step, um, but um, one thing you can immediately notice, right, especially if you're using a dense convolutional neural network, is these representations are very sparse, right? Meaning if you feed one of these dense pixel maps into a neural network, you're going to spend most of your time um, you know, pulling out a receptive field and multiplying numbers by zero, which you don't need a GPU to do that. Um, 
And so I think a lot of the push to try and abandon dense CNN methods has its roots in um, these kind of scaling issues, right? Where you can do the same thing much more efficiently if you have a sparse representation of your data. Right? And so um, the first paper on doing uh, sparse convolutions for, for physics um, was this uh, sparse Uresnet architecture from this paper in 2019 that works in an idealized liquid argon detector. Um, they show that the, basically you can use a unit architecture um, to um, classify voxels, right? So they have a, an upstream preprocessing step where they take the 2D um, hits and then they do space point reconstruction. They match the hits between uh, detector planes to, to get to a 3D space and then they voxelize their space points and they apply a sparse convolutional neural network to that. Um, and so um, this operates on the 3D voxels and this is classifying each voxel according to particle type. So this is kind of doing a segmentation or, or classification task. Um, and the, the fact that you have the sparse voxel map means that uh, you, you kind of operate on an infinite manifold, right? You don't need to truncate your image down to um, some fixed size in order to fit it into GPU memory. You don't need to downsample it to a lower resolution, right? You, you aren't bound by the same limitations on the dense image size. Um, and so you can kind of treat your entire detector um, as the input rather than having to, to pick a, a small subset out, right? Um, and so at the time, this network used uh, Minkowski Engine, which is a toolkit which um, was developed at Stanford for sparse convolutions in PyTorch. Um, I'll come back to this workflow a little later because since then it's developed um, and touches graph networks um, in some ways that are interesting, but, but I will circle back around to that. Um, so there are sparse convolutional neural network applications, but uh, that too has its limitations, right? Primarily, I think one of the, one of the limitations of sparse CNNs is that it does enforce these kind of um, domain um, restrictions where you have to be in this regular grid, right? You have to be able to describe your data on, on a regular grid. Um, and you have these arbitrary transformations like in the, in the sparse CNN I just described, you are um, basically having to group your hits into space points and then arbitrarily voxelize those space points in order to be able to feed this into a CNN. If you work in a graph network, you immediately have a lot more freedom to define your problem, right? And so you aren't having to manipulate your data in order to match the structure of the, of the algorithm, right? You can actually change your algorithm to match the structure of your data. Um, and so graph neural network um, applications started to, to be explored um, around 2018, I would say, roughly. Um, one of the first papers was IceCube, um, which is kind of the platonic ideal of the detector that doesn't generalize well to a CNN. Um, they have used CNN um, applications successfully in the past, but um, the structure of this uh, experiment, I, I, if you're not aware, it's a really incredible experiment. They essentially have turned a, a sheet of Antarctic ice uh, you know, kilometers in size into a neutrino detector. There's, a, there's an area with very pure ice um, and they melt the ice and drop down these optical modules on strings very deep down in the ice. And so when very high energy particles up to like a PEV, um, much higher energy than any other neutrino experiment, um, kind of interacts in the ice, it produces this light, this Cherenkov radiation, which we can measure, which they do measure. Um, but because of the structure of the detector, right, it is optical modules hanging on strings. Um, it is basically uh, perfect for describing as a graph, right, where each graph node is a detector module, right, in this kind of irregular um, structure. Um, and so they trained a neural network, a graph neural network, um, on the uh, on the detector architecture as a graph to try to disambiguate. It basically was a binary classifier, which for a given event, um, uh, sorry, for for a given event which would either be muon, a muon cascade from a neutrino or a muon cascade just from activity in the atmosphere, um, basically a signal versus background projector. They found that the GNN uh, outperformed uh, both their traditional like non-machine learning methods and a, a comparable CNN method um, to identify these new candidates. Um, so, question about the general approach. It sounds like you can do this from raw data, but like Ashkeep, it sounds like there's not nearly enough raw data before you start, not enough classification. So presumably, it, it sounds a lot like you're making a, you, you're simulating these events in a proper simulation, like a detailed one, right. and you just, you, you're, this is a neural surrogate, but I don't right. know the name, right? Sure, yeah, right. And, and, and that's, that's uh, 
I think most of the um, applications I will describe today are, are basically kind of that kind of application, right? Where you um, have a, a kind of a surrogate for the, the detector, right? You describe things. Um, okay. So way. then it sounds like if I were to glibly like summarize the whole field, its previous approach was a bunch of manual uh, inverse functions for these things for 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 forward simulations, and right. they were you know kludgy because it's it's these are hard; they're not actually differentiable or invertible. Right. And these are ML inverses, which are more accurate because they're more holistic uh, and also more black box. So you right. Exactly. It's 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 yes. So instead of it's less a modeling problem directly in that you're trying to come up with a theoretical model to describe your data. It's more that you already have the model and you're trying to use the model to reverse engineer the inputs from your simulation using a neural network, right? So it's, 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 a, little, it's a little different, right? You are um, using neural networks, right? Like you said, like in inverse, right? You're going backwards from the observables to the inputs. Um, okay. and, and trying to develop algorithms that can effectively operate on the simulation and the data in the same way. Got it. And so it, it is the classic problem of in, inverting giant simulations which don't want to be inverted. Exactly. And in that sense, you do have a lot of common tools, but they depend on the funny structure of the forward simulation. Right. Okay, cool. Got it. Thank you. Sure. Um, and so, yes, also with with uh, Heptrix, um, so this is a, a kind of a... Um, R&D project that started out for exploring graph neural networks for tracking in the high luminosity LHC. Um, this uh, looked at the uh, the silicon in the high luminosity LHC detector um, and looked at the detector hits in the silicon. Right, you can see these kind of sequential layers in this bottom right plot. Um, and if effectively, you're training a graph neural network to do link prediction, right, to to draw lines between sequential detector layers um, to try to reconstruct what they call particle jets, right? These particle tracks, um, and determine which which hits on the in the detector should be associated as part of the same um, particle, which which is again something that traditional um, algorithms already do in high luminosity LHC. The big constraint for them is um, with the things scale very badly, right? As a as a function of like computational cost. Um, they, they really experience a lot of um, computational overheads in the LHC in terms of their workflow. Um, and so the, the kind of genesis of this project or the motivation for this project was to try to figure out how to more efficiently, both in terms of uh, better performance, but also in terms of like lower computational cost, right? Reconstruct um, tracks in the detector, right? And so this project was, I think, pretty successful. They, sh they showed a pretty promising proof of concept and that spun out into Exitrix. Um, so this is the collaboration that I work within. Um, this this collaboration started around 2018 um, and continued Heptrix on two fronts, right? The intensity frontier. So spinning out this LHC-based effort into the Codagon TBCs. So I, I developed a graph neural network called NewGraph, which is trying to reconstruct um, uh, neutrino interactions using graph neural networks. Um, and then in the energy frontier, also taking that proof of concept um, from the high luminosity LHC and incorporating it into the, the full simulation and validation chain and also uh, building it out into something that's kind of more robust and end-to-end. -end. Um, this collaboration officially ended last year, um, but all of the constituent parts of this collaboration are still kind of actively working on their respective pieces, so so it kind of lives on in spirit. Um, so the, the reconstruction work that I do um, is, is kind of aimed towards coming up with a general purpose graph neural network um, workflow for particle reconstruction in neutrino physics. Um, the, the goal, I think, eventually is kind of like a Swiss Army knife, like a general purpose tool that people can use to do different things. Um, again, we had like a first generation proof of concept a few years ago. Um, it, it showed that the, the graph network was capable of learning uh, kind of like at the base level, but in a lot of ways, it really wasn't um, appropriate for the problem we, we actually want to solve, right? It was still looking at link prediction, but unlike the high luminosity LHC, which has these radial layers, which mean give you a natural constraint on the connections in your graph, a, uh, a TVC, right? The structure of the physics compared to the detected geometry has no such constraints. Everything is kind of densely connected together. And so when you try to do link prediction, you are very uh, susceptible to um, 
you know, false positives that can completely tank everything, right? Um, and so this is an example of, of the, the ground truth where you're trying to label graph edges according to particle type with a, with a proton track here in an electromagnetic shower. You can see, like, around the roots, it's doing a decent job, but there are a lot of places specifically in the in the EM shower where it's, it's um, getting things wrong, especially away from the, the kind of center of the shower, right? Um, and so the second generation model that, that we kind of finalized um, late last year operates on detector hits instead, right? And so this, um, at, this, at this stage for the second generation is specifically thinking about detector hits, um, doing message passing to try to A, filter out background hits, so any hits that are not associated with the primary physics interaction. And then once you remove background, you're then trying to classify signal hits according to particle type, right? To, to try and make sense of what is left in your event. Um, so we, we describe physics events as uh, heterogeneous graphs. Um, we connect hits within each plane using Delaunay triangulation. Um, this is just a, a kind of a, a geometric algorithm that we um, utilize to inject connectivity into the graph, right? We actually tried a lot of different ways of, um, of connecting graphs together, and we found that Delaunay worked best. Actually, for TPCs, the specific geometry we work with has regions of dead wires, um, and so any graph edge forming technique that uh, only generates local connections um, kind of falls apart once you enter one of these dead regions. So the, the nice thing about the Lonnie triangulation is it gives you a nice mixture of short and long range connections. That actually means you're really robust against any um, kind of real conditions that a detector operates under. Um, we also use um, 3D reconstruction to basically get a naive reconstruction of space points to try and match hits between planes. And then we can use that to um, generate a new set of virtual graph nodes that are basically a nexus for connecting hits between planes and exchanging information. So we utilize a self-attention message passing network um, as the core convolution engine. And you basically have a two-step network, right? Where um, first you path messages internally inside each graph plane. Um, in kind of a, a 2D only step where you only see information from within the plane you're working within. Um, and then you project those up to 3D nexus nodes and blend information between planes to help um, you know, figure out degeneracies, right? If there is a, if there is a um, track that, that looks weird or um, has incomplete information in one of the views, then you can pull in information from the other views to help um, recover that and, and break those degeneracies. Um, and so the network um, works well for background filtering. We get a, an overall precision recall of around 97, 98%. Um, the other great thing is it's very fast to run inference, even on a CPU. Um, and so we can, we can use this uh, once the network is trained to predict events um, using a kind of memory overhead and runtime that is comparable to traditional techniques. Um, there is a, a, a whole lot that I could say on kind of inference pipelines and, and how we incorporate these type of networks into the reconstruction chain that I, I don't have anything on because I'm already way over time. Um, in terms of hit classification, the network is also um, pretty good at uh, identifying particle type. Um, we get around 95% precision and recall here too. Um, the biggest challenge here is Michel electrons. These are just um, pretty rare in our um, training data set, right? They are far less um, common than uh, hits from things like muons, right? Muons produce more hits and also you get more muons. Um, and so trying to balance the network performance from these uh, kind of very common particle types and the more rare particle types has been a big challenge. Actually, one um, technique we found works really well um, is what's called recall loss. I, I feel like I see a lot of people talking about using the focal loss um, to uh, to weight their cross entropy loss. Or actually, recall loss. This paper here, as far as I know, I don't know. I've not talked to many people who are aware of this paper, but it really worked phenomenally for us um, at improving performance on these kind of more rare uh, prediction types, right? The Michel electrons. Um, and so here's a here's a quick example event. Um, using the graph neural network architecture we, we developed. So here, this is kind of like the full event, including the, um, the cosmic background overlay. So you can see in, in kind of gray here, this is the ground truth, right? These are the truth labels. So everything labeled in color is according to a particle type. And then everything in gray is 
the background that we filter out. This is the prediction, and then I'll switch to the network output. You can see, for the most part, the network is doing a, a pretty fantastic job of removing the background hits overall. Um, it's able to reject this cosmic track that actually intersects um, pretty significantly with uh, the physics interaction, right? So it's able to kind of pull out um, and recognize that this is not part of the, the interaction itself. Um, we can then remove the background and take a look at just the semantic prediction. So here you can see the physics content. So we have a, a number of electromagnetic showers here. We have a, a high, highly ionizing particle here. This is a proton. Uh, and then we have some minimum ionizing tracks coming out from that. And then there's also a, a Michel electron deposition. Um, and the, um, this is the true semantic labels filtered by truth. And I'll jump to the filter, the predicted semantic labels filtered by prediction. Um, and so this representation isn't perfect, but it is actually a pretty faithful reproduction of what we get in the ground truth. And so the, the network is actually, in this case, performing very well on this. Relatively speaking, um, uh, this is a pretty uh, high multiplicity event. Right? We, this is a lot more particles than you get in the typical booster neutrino beamline. Um, and so the GNN is, is able to uh, do a, a decent job, right? a, a pretty good job of, of reconstructing the particle content this event, which is very encouraging. Um, very quickly, let me talk about the high luminosity LHC, the Exitrix side of this. They have a similar graph neural network. Um, they actually have a series of neural networks they train one after the other. Um, the first is um, to generate a kind of learned embedding where you try to cluster um, the detector hits close to each other. You have a hinge loss to project them into a space where physical proximity corresponds to kind of conceptual similarity, right? To try and, and cluster together hits from the same track. Um, they then use um, a radius-based approach in that, in that space to generate graph edges. They then have a, a binary classifier to try and prune some of the false positives in that space. Um, and then the output of that is then uh, fed into an attention message passing graph neural network that actually is classifying graph edges to do link prediction, right? Um, and so you can see in this in this plot on the right, um, this is the uh, fraction of reconstructed particles um, in the high luminosity LHC as a function of um, the transverse momentum of the particle in the top right, um, and the uh, pseudo rapidity in the bottom right, which is basically um, an energy measure on, on top and an angular measure on the bottom, um, right? Um, and so they, they have the physics efficiency, which is just overall, like, what fraction of the particles were reconstructed correctly. They also define this technical efficiency, which essentially removes any particles which just aren't reconstructable because they don't produce enough hits in the detector. Um, and so when you remove the, the, the uh, particles that aren't reconstructable from the equation, you end up with a pretty high efficiency, right, in the in the uh, high 90s in terms of percentage. Um, and so the network is is uh, pretty pretty uh, performant at reconstructing um, particles and and tracks in the high luminosity LHC. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll note that there is a kind of a newer network that I, I won't talk about in detail right now. Um, from uh, Xtrix collaborator on a new variant of the network called the Influencer Network that is a little bit more end-to-end -end, that kind of unifies these um, separate steps into a single model and tries to kind of combine the pipeline. Um, I'm running very low on time. Um, and so, in fact, I'm already well over time. So I'm going to go pretty quickly here. Um, physicists um, have kind of developed analogs for uh, machine learning concepts that there's this one tool that is used in high-energy physics called object condensation that basically borrows the concept of attractive and repulsive potentials um, to try to uh, utilize that to generate a loss function to try and do clustering. And this basically learns for every object a charge um, that on the one, one end, um, on, on the, kind of the, the binary classifier end, on the low end is trying to remove objects entirely that should not be clustered, but on the high end is trying to learn condensation points, right? The centers um, for around which you uh, learn clusters. Um, and the idea is that you you basically use this object condensation loss to try to cluster together hits um, and then materialize that downstream using a, an offline algorithm, something like a, a DB scan, like a density-based approach. 
The high luminosity LHC um, has been thinking also about machine learning for particle flow. So this is the idea that once you have clustered um, your hits into objects, you then basically do a transformation um, to uh, predict the particles themselves and the relationships between the particles. Right? You go from essentially an observable space to the kind of conceptual space of what are the underlying um, quantities of the of the particle, um, where you, you basically use a graph network to convolve um, your input clusters um, and do message passing in that space. And, and through a learned embedding, you are outputting a, a set that is thinking more about uh, particle identification um, and the, the kind of direct observables like energy. Um, and then you, you define a loss function to basically try to train the network to undergo that transformation. right? Um, and so this is kind of a, a step above the, the clustering space that I mentioned previously. Um, and then that Slack group I mentioned earlier um, has been working on sparse CNNs to do full particle reconstruction, um, right? To, to use their sparse CNN to cluster together um, detector voxels into kind of sub clusters and then uh, feed those into a graph neural network, which is clustering together track fragments into full particles, and then also trying to learn the hierarchy, right, to figure out which particles are the parents of which other particles, right? So again, this is thinking um, about kind of a full end-to-end -end pipeline where you go from the hits all the way up to a full representation of the physics event, right? And so this is a, a lot of the, um, the workflow that we are considering and are working on for the third generation graph network. Um, the high luminosity LHC folks have explored hierarchical GNNs kind of as a um, uh, an analog to a unit where you essentially aggregate your full resolution graph based on gra like generalized graph pooling into a smaller space, and that allows for longer range connections. But the, the the pooled graph and the hierarchical levels aren't really physically interpretable. And I think one of the one of the big things we're pursuing right now is tying together a lot of these ideas, right, in terms of um, how can we pull together the low-level clustering problems into the, um, the kind of hierarchical problems of figuring out the relationships between particles and then building that all the way back up to the interaction, right? So these are the hierarchical levels that I talked about earlier. Can we train a graph network that is hierarchical where the hierarchies actually have a physical interpretation, right? Um, and the idea is that instead of having this kind of sequential one-by-one reconstruction chain where you have all of these inefficiencies, you have something that is fully differentiable in terms of going back from the observables to the simulation ground truth, training a network to do that in reverse on your simulation and then applying that to the data in order to have this really nice native reconstruction. Um, and so that's that's it. Uh, that's, that's all I had. Yeah, well, fantastic. It's extremely complete. This is awesome. Sure. No worries. Okay, well, great. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.